I come from the Mon Valley. I hope you're smarter than the kids that I deal with on a daily basis. But this can tell a lot about your intelligence. Is Twix a candy bar or a cookie? Wait, wait, wait. Please stand up if you think it's a candy bar. Please stand up if you think it's a candy bar. Okay? Please sit down. Please stand up if you think it's a cookie. All of you are the smartest people in the room because it is a cookie. Look at the wrapper. It's a cookie. It's in the, on the wrapper, so there we go. So everyone, stand up. Jump up and down three times. We're not gonna do Simon Says yet. Sit down, okay? My name is uh, Father Daniel D'Antonio. Once again, I, I'm glad to be here at uh, St. Martha and Mary. I think this is the fifth or sixth year I've done these. So um, it's great to be back. Uh, once again, I started, I was Mr. D'Antonio. Then as a seminarian, um, I, was, I did this as a deacon and now as a priest. I was ordained a priest this past June, so I've been ordained uh, three and a half years. Um, I'm, it's three and a half months, I'm sorry. It feels like three and a half years. But um, my parish is if you go to Kennywood, anything that you see, that's where I'm at. Homestead, Duquesne, Braddock, West Mifflin, uh, Wilkins, Turtle Creek, that whole area is where actually I came from. So we're going to begin here because this is a long day for me. So what we're going to talk today is faith and reason in science. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on me. First of all, I entered the seminary my second time when I was 40. I studied in college biology, chemistry, and business. So I'm here to tell you that you can reconcile our faith, science, and reason. And when I talk about reason, does anyone know what I'm talking about? It's the ability to what? If I reason, what am I using? What am I doing? I gotta figure out something, what is that? Um, T-H is the first two letters. Thinking. thinking, yes, the ability to think. Think things through. So the one thing I wanna tell you is faith and science are compatible. They are actually complementary. They do not contradict each other. You just have to ask the right question, okay? so. And you have to also know, especially with the Bible, you have to know the genre or what type of book you're reading. Does everyone here read? No? Okay, if you have to read, raise your hand if you read. Okay, do you read for school? Okay. I think you people just like watch videos now of the books you're supposed to read. Is that what you do? We had cliff notes. So. Does anyone tell me, give me a type of book. A fiction book, another one. A fantasy book. Science fiction. Dystopian. Dystopian, what's the other type? There's fiction and what's the other? Nonfiction, give me a nonfiction. Nonfiction type. Biography, back here. A what? Historical fiction, we'll say that's nonfiction here, Pine Richland Hockey. Autobiography, okay, what's another one? How about a science book? That would be nonfiction. So when we read the Bible, because you're going to see this contradiction between faith and science in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. But what you have to understand is the author of Genesis isn't writing a science book or a contemporary history book. What it actually is, is a poem that expresses stuff that truly happened that has to do with our salvation. It's actually not talking about science. So that's how they reconcile. We have to understand how to read the Bible and understand what type of genre we're reading. So that's the crux of it, actually. Once again, there should be no contradiction between faith and science or faith and reason. So, could someone tell me, what is the first three chapters of Genesis? What type of literature is it? It 
Is it a science book? Stand up. If, is it a poem-like thing? Stand up. Everyone should stand up. It's a poem-like thing. Okay, good job. Give yourselves a round of applause for being so smart. You can sit back down. So this is another thing about faith in science. Science answers questions of how, what, when of the material world. Okay, would everyone agree? Raise your hand if you agree with me. Okay, everyone agrees. Do you agree? Okay, cool. So questions like how big is the universe? When did it begin? How did it begin? That's what science answers. For that, we're looking at the Big Bang Theory would do all that stuff. So it deals with matter, material things, atoms, stars, chemicals. I study biology and chemistry. So we are looking at different things like that all the time. How does the brain work? That would be uh, neurochemistry. What caused the dinosaurs to go extinct? Those are what science asks. Okay? So faith, when we get into faith, answers the why and other big questions. And this is where we get the difference. Faith answers why was the universe created? What is, why is there something rather than nothing? What is the purpose of life? Can someone see the purpose of life under a microscope? Stand up if you can weigh the purpose of life. <laughs> Everyone just point to him and laugh. I'm sorry, that was mean, that was mean. I'm a terrible person. Okay, that was a joke. I hope, I hope you're okay. So can you, um, what's the color of the purpose of life? There is none, right? So once again, science can't answer these questions. We get that from faith. Let's see how smart you really are. What is the purpose of life? Jesus is part of the answer. What's the actual, what makes you, what is the purpose of life and your happiness? It's the biggest question you need to answer in your life. I thought mine was money, wasn't. To get to heaven, yes. To know, love, and serve God in this world and to be happy with him forever. Who's the guy that said heaven? That guy, stand up. Everyone give him a round of applause. Okay. So, next question, why did God create the universe? Yes, the God created the universe for you so you can have a what with him? A relationship. Good job. Everyone stand up and give yourselves a round of applause. Okay, sit back down. The next time I'm going to have you people body slam each other just to see if it, it will happen. So here's another thing about science and religion. Actually, the majority of scientific discoveries that you are studying at your grade level come from people who are believers. The majority of them are priests and religious. So you're, here are a couple. Um, George Lemaitre, he is the Big Bang Theory guy. The um, genetics, Felix Mendelssohn, who is father Felix Mendelssohn. Father George Lemaitre. So these are actually priests who actually did this. Blaise Pascal, if you take calculus, he was a believer. So once again, the majority of scientists believe in a creator. They could have a difference of what that means, but they do believe in a creator. There's a resource that I highly recommend if any of you are scientifically inclined. It's called the Magis Center and it's full of articles about faith, reason, and science. Studying the human body, studying astrophysics, and stuff like that. <clears throat> Once again, faith and science, there should not be any contradiction between faith and science. The big thing would be evolution. Has anyone ever heard of the theory of evolution?
Okay, stand up if you've heard of evolution. Okay, and that's usually in biology class. Everyone stand up. Jump up four times. Clap your hands three times. Can I get a hand clap and a Ric Flair? That guy, did, do it again, follow him. There we go. Everyone sit back down. Let's do Sorry, it should be a two claps. Woo! That's the two claps and a Ric Flair. I screwed that up. Can I get two claps and a Ric Flair? There we go. Did any of you play football? Do you do that in football still? Okay, that must have been my goofy coaches. Never mind. Okay? So, we're going to talk about faith and evolution. They actually are compatible. As a Catholic Christian, you can believe in the theory of evolution and what we believe about God in creation. All we have to believe is God guided it. Okay, and that was figured out by the popes right when it came out. So that's the difference between us and maybe our Protestant brothers and sisters. Once again, faith and science are different systems. Science works on the material world. Faith and reason, the meaning of the material world, and spiritual things. So there's two types of things in the world. What would they be? The two categories that might be underlined. Who has good eyesight? Boom. Yes, immaterial and material things. So a material thing would be the sun, my computer, the cross, this thing, okay? It can be measured, seen under a microscope, weighed, observed with the senses. Stand up if you agree with that statement. Okay, so there are material things, okay? They're real, right? Raise your hand if they're real. Okay, give me two claps and a Ric Flair. Okay, sit back down. Okay, I'm just gonna just beat that to death now. So, the other thing are immaterial things. Love, justice, beauty, goodness, truth. Okay, does everyone see that you can't see those under a microscope, right? Can you see math? You can see the work math, right? You can see what you're writing on a paper or on your computer, but can you actually see what addition is? The concept, right? You can't see logic, a spe anything spiritual, or even something called the natural law. These are all things that we use our reason for, our ability to think. For example, triangle. There's a physical triangle, but you have the concept triangle that you actually is in your mind, right? Okay? So that's an immaterial thing. And then finally we have things of faith. These are things that God has to reveal to us. So that would be the nature of God. How many gods are there, someone? One. 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 Wow. You're way smarter than the kids in the Mon Valley. Um, how many persons in that one God? Three. 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 Wow. Okay. Salvation. The purpose of the universe in the problem of evil. So these are things that faith teaches us about. So we have material, immaterial, and things of faith. Once again, this is what I really like. Science can inform faith. Can someone tell me, have you heard of the Big Bang and not the television show? You might not have done that yet. In, what is the Big Bang? It, in the, what period of time? Like the beginning, yes. Everyone give him a round of applause. Can you stand up and bow? Can you stand up and bow? Now give him the round of applause for being my scientist, okay? So what the Big Bang Theory is that George Lemaitre and Einstein and all these people worked on is there was a giant explosion at the beginning of the universe. How they observed that was using telescopes in Arizona and across the Earth, they noticed that two stars were moving at a very different speed in this way. And they concluded that 
the universe is expanding through a crazy calculation, I couldn't even tell you what it is, that the universe is expanding like we blow up a balloon. And from that, they were able to calculate the beginning of the universe. That there was a giant, for, for lack of a better term, explosion that then formed everything. Okay, and I believe it's 65 billion years ago. It's either 65 or 16, so don't quote me on that. It's been a while since I took the class. So then it asks us a question. If there was a Big Bang that started everything, what started the Big Bang? We would say God, something bigger than the universe. We would call that God, okay? So do you see, if there was a beginning, there must be a beginner. Does that make sense? Okay, a man named Aristotle figured that out 2,000 years, uh, 3,000 years ago. I'm sorry, 2,500 years ago. The other thing about the Big Bang that's very interesting, if I got a bunch of giant fireworks, I was just at an Italian festival, I'm missing the fireworks, and I put all kinds of, like millions upon millions of Scrabble pieces. Do you know what Scrabble is? I'm old. Who has prayed Scrabble? Okay, the word game? Okay, put your hands down. If I put all of that into a top of a firework, a giant firework, millions upon millions of Scrabble pieces, I blow it up. Could I get the works of Shakespeare or the Encyclopedia Britannica? Would it just form? It's improbable, right? Okay, so when I, this is one of the things that I piqued my interest. If we started from a giant explosion, how did we get to the most complex being ever made, which is a woman? <laughs> the physical process, the physical chemical process, the woman is the most complex, we're, on, we're talking on a medical chemistry basis, being. And it would have just been out of pure chance, and it would have only been in 100,000 years. I looked at that and said it's improbable that there wasn't something guiding it. Because once again, have you ever heard of the Krebs cycle? In biology, it gives us, AT, was it ATP makes energy, yeah. stuff like that. I studied that in college for an entire year, the complex chemical reactions of that. So once again, something so complex comes from an explosion, probably not something there. So we have a fine-tuned design. This is the ba major thing for me because I love anatomy and physiology. The complex complexity of the human body. Male and female bodies that are able to reproduce, that should be able to reproduce. So you had two beings that had to evolve separately, but also were able to reproduce and they're perfectly complementary. So you have to not do that Scrabble thing once, but twice, and then have them be perfect together. So once again, it shows that there's a design. If something goes wrong in your body, you know the design. Who has ever broken a bone? Okay? If you would study the process of fixing a broken bone, what your body does automatically, you would probably believe in God. So many trillions of things have to happen to fix that bone and be able to walk again. Once again, mine was personally the complexity of the human eye. When I studied the human eye in seeing in college, we looked at the very back, like in your retina, the roads and the, we looked at the chemical reactions and all that stuff, and it was too complex just to happen. We actually don't know actually what goes on, or else we can make blind people see.
the complex chemicals and how everything's going on, I don't think could just happen. So I think someone, God guided it along the way. So once again, the complexity of the human eye. The other thing about the eye is you see and you know what you see automatically, instantaneously. No supercomputer could ever do that. And this is a fascinating fact, cell replacement. Every two weeks, not, I think it's, we'll say 97% of your body is completely replaced. Minus your bones, that takes seven years. So at each moment, you have trillions of cells dying and trillions of cells being replacing them at every instant. Just think about that for a second. When that goes wrong, that's where we get cancer. But just think about that. The complex biochemical reactions, trillions of activities going on right now to keep you alive. Trillions upon trillions. Once again, faith and reason. Everyone stand up, I'm losing you, and I'm losing myself. Everyone clap three times. <laughs> clap four times. Everybody clap your hands. Okay, sit back down. Okay, so Catholic Christianity and reason. Ability to think do not contradict each other. So reason and faith cannot contradict each other e either. Faith goes beyond reason. It cannot contradict that. Does everyone understand that? So reason is its level. Faith is one level above it. So it's important for you to understand that you could use your knowledge to come to the existence of God. You don't need the Bible. You need the Bible for details, but to understand that God exists, you do not need the Bible. Pagan Greek philosophers, Aristotle and Plato, who has heard of them? Okay, what school do you guys go to that you know this? Pine oh, Pine Richland, okay. I went to West Mifflin, we didn't know this yet. Did someone just boo West Mifflin? That's kind of insulting, okay. I have a question, who here thinks soccer's a sport? You people are completely nuts. Okay, next thing. Okay, here we go, revelation, we're almost done. Revelation, that is faith, we get that from the Word of God, Bible on our tradition, and that's God revealing himself to us. So we have science, reason, revelation slash faith. This is the only way we can go beyond that God exists and to know He is, who He is, how He interacts with us. So once again, Trinity, Incarnation, Love, Mercy, and Compassion of God. We get that through the Bible, but the big thing was witnesses. In my life, my great uncle John, he was one of the greatest guys I've ever met. He went to Mass every day. But he was a ton of fun, and he's one of the reasons why I ended up going back to church in my mid-20s. In my case, I had, I've actually met seven people who could probably be saints. One is Mary of Mount Carmel. She lived in Loretto, Pennsylvania, where St. Francis University is. I met her when I was 24. She was about 89, crippled, and a nun who never left a convent. She smiled at me. That's all she did. And now I'm a priest because of just one smile. It was a little crazy, it was a real crazy journey, but that's the first person that actually showed God to me just with a smile. And that's one, once again what God wants to do with all of you. We can also look at nature, just looking at the beauty of nature. One of the most beautiful things I got to do in my life is hold my uh, niece and nephews when they were newborns. And once you hold a newborn baby, you just have to think that there's a God because it's just such a wonderful thing. And then we could look at histories and cultures. Across all cultures and all times, they believe in a God. They have religious ceremonies. They bury their dead. They think that there's an afterlife. And you would study this like if you went to Duquesne University 
in a history of religion. Once again, reason. We can use our powers to observe and think to conclude that it is reasonable to state that God exists. And we kind of did that already, so I'm just going to move forward. These are some things that we're not going to go through, but just to show you that they exist. This is from the man Aristotle from 2,500 years ago. They're the five proofs for the existence of God. And these are what St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas uses to really help us understand our Christian faith. We can look at motion. You can see that there's a motion, observe a leaf, and then keep on taking it back. And then you'll get to, there has to be something that started it. That thing would be God. You can look at cause and effect. Everything is a cause. But it can't go back to infinity. There has to be something that caused the cause. An uncaused cause. We would say that's God. The designer. We, once again, we could look at the stars. We could look at our body. There's a designer. Perfection is my favorite one. All of us ask questions as people, right? So everyone knows what love is, and they know that they want more love. So that means that there has to be perfect love. That perfect love is God. And we could take a whole thing to go through these. So we're not gonna bore you with that. There's something called the transcendentals. That's just a fancy word, everyone repeat it. Transcendentals. transcendentals. That's the true, the good, the beautiful, and perfect being. That's what all of you are looking for in life. You're looking for the true good to love you, like you want to be loved. You're looking for all knowledge. You're looking for the beautiful, not only physically beautiful, but morally beautiful. And you're looking for perfection. So there must be something that is perfectly all of those and that is God, the way, the truth, and the life. Once again, we're never satisfied and we want more of that stuff. I've never stopped asking questions because I'm looking for the ultimate answer. That answer is God. And we could go on through, you even use chemistry and stuff. Once again, this is faith. Everyone stand up. Simon says sit down. Simon says stand up. Sit down. Oh, everyone, okay. Everyone back, sit back down, okay. There, oh, um, Simon says sit down, sorry. I forgot I was playing Simon Says. Okay, finally, we come to faith. Ultimately, it is the gift of faith that enables us to come to a certain knowledge that God exists. When I was studying the human eyeball, it was the special grace of God that made me put two and two together. It was the grace of God when I met Mary of Mount Carmel. Once, but also, we still need to use our minds and have a reason for our faith. That's why we study the faith. Once again, faith is believing what God has revealed. So God reveals that he is Trinity, that he became incarnate in Jesus Christ, that there's a Holy Spirit, that he loves you and wants a relationship with you. But there's another aspect of faith that you have to understand what that is. And what faith is, this is my favorite definition, the call of God to which I respond. Everyone say that, the call of God to which I respond. So what is faith? The call of God to which I respond. If you're not louder, we're just going to go on for minutes and minutes and minutes doing this. What is faith? The call of God to which I respond. That's perfect. Thank you. You. 
So, faith is the call of God to which I respond. That goes back to my homily. What you each have to, in, have to understand is God calls each one of you at every moment into a relationship with Him. You could start it now, and I would recommend that, or at some point in your life, you have to open the door. He knocks constantly. He shows you beauty. He shows you goodness. He shows you truth. He showers gifts upon you. But what He wants to do is have you ent- him, allow Him to come deeper into your life. And that's actually what makes you happy. Because he's truth, goodness, love itself. All of us have an infinite hole in our hearts. And God became a man in Jesus to fill that hole. And my prayer for you as I'm ending the talk right now is that you meet the Jesus of Nazareth that I met. My God who is able to change my life. And you might not believe believe me. That's fine and I get that too. I was your age. But I could tell you one thing. What I deal with as a priest, I go through very difficult things. I buried a 15-year-old two weeks ago who got killed in a car crash. And I thank God Almighty that God was there to hold me and carry me through that. Because it was probably one of the most difficult things I've ever been through in my life. I've lost jobs. I've lost my father. I have lost my best friend at 24. And if I didn't have God... I wouldn't be here probably today. I definitely wouldn't be talking to Edge. But in those difficult moments, I had something that was a sure foundation, and that was God. And he gave me his spirit to carry me through those difficult situations. And that's what I want for all of you, and that's going to be my prayer tonight and into the future, that all of you meet Jesus of Nazareth, the God who loves you and who wants to change your life, but to be with you at every moment. And the one thing I also want to let you know, that he is with you every moment. So if you're ever down, if you ever have the blues, if life seems like it's blowing up, God is with you. In my life, another thing about me that I want to let you know, I was in a body cast for six months. I had to learn how to walk three times in my life. I suffer quite a bit. But I found God that gives me the strength to go through all of that. Once again, you play sports. I could have probably had a scholarship until my knee got ripped off playing football. If I didn't have God in my life, what would I have? So that was able... That's what it really means, young ladies and young men, to have God with you. And he wants to be with you. And in difficult moments, you don't despair or become despondent. You reach out to him. And he'll give you eternal life, eternal happiness, and eternal joy forever. Amen. Everyone, could you please stand up? Can I get two, can I get two claps in a Ric Flair? Can I get two claps in a Ric Flair? Can I get two claps and a Ric Flair? Now give me, now give me a standing ovation. Thank you. Thank you.